Shares of Disney hitting a new high in the session. That stock up about 2%. Disney, of course, one of many companies out there that have seen huge growth in their streaming platforms this year. Take a look at these numbers here. Netflix up 62% year to date. Amazon up 80%. Roku up 153% and Disney up about 25% year to date. So let's look ahead to the outlook for 2021. We've got Mark Boydman. He's the head of marketing and media tech services at PJ Solomon. And Mark, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, you know, I, I know it, it's a cliche, but in many ways, 2020 was really the perfect storm for these streaming platforms with so many of us streaming stuck at home. Um, how much of a leveling off do you anticipate going into 2021, especially just given the huge growth that we saw this year? Thanks, thanks, Akika. Look, I think what's interesting here is you're seeing tremendous growth that we would have seen but for the pandemic. And now with the pandemic, it's accelerated that growth. So what you're seeing is traditional pay TV subscribers who are migrating to over-the-top programming. And the pandemic has accelerated that because consumers want the ability to stream content from anywhere and without any contracts or hidden fees or a cable box. Yeah, Mark, I mean, when we talk about the trends here, not only are people streaming more, but it's it's becoming quite obvious that a lot of these companies are going to be shelling out a ridiculous amount of money on the content itself. Uh, you think about what we saw from Disney uh, saying that they're going to be spending, what, $16 billion potentially by 2024 on content here. So talking about maybe how the costs are going to be rising as all these competitors buy for a lot of the same content in many instances. Right. And look, that's the power of, the, of streaming is the content, the consumers winning because we're seeing more content choices and having the ability to you know, stream what you want when you want it. And the content spend is a key you know, distinguishing factor between each of these streaming services, right? That original content. So Disney has to spend, Netflix has been spending you know, close to 20 billion. Uh, you're seeing Apple spending. They have to spend, it's the content uh, that drives consumers to streaming. And if you think about the, again, the ability to stream when you want, where you want it and having no contract, right? So if the content isn't there, you could easily decide to stream elsewhere. So I think content is really the, the distinguishing factor and you're gonna continue to see companies spend rather than just rely uh, on their historical libraries, which Disney has definitely done. But you know, the original content that Disney and others will roll out will continue to drive new subscribers. Mark, the ongoing question in the space, though, is just to what extent uh, consumers are going to continue to pay for some of these subscriptions. And you've talked about the ad-supported system here, the, the streaming site sort of being able to be offered for free to a certain extent. How much growth do you anticipate on that front? And, and which one of the players are we talking about um, who, who may make that pivot increasingly as they see their subscriber numbers start to level off? Right. And that's that is the exciting thing about streaming is that, you know, initially it was paid, you know, all, you had to pay in order to, to subscribe to one of these streaming services. Now they have ad supported streaming services that are gaining traction with real content. And so if you're open to watching some ads or all ads, you're able to reduce or in many cases see free streaming, which is pretty powerful. And we're seeing real growth there. Um, one, you're seeing ad spend migrating to these streaming services. And two, you're seeing better content uh, on ad-supported streaming services. And you're also seeing three new companies, new entrants into free streaming or ad-supported streaming. So really, again, the consumer is really the, the winner here because you have a lot more choices. Um, you know, it's really a separation between what we view as old media, you know, watching pay TV and having to subscribe to numerous channels because they were bundled together. The ability to decide to stream what you want. And if it's ad-supported, you know, even better, because as a consumer, you can make the choice to watch streaming with ads or watch streaming without ads and pay for it. Uh, and we're seeing a hybrid where you have the ability to spend five or six dollars a month and watch some ads or ad light models, uh, but still stream and, and see less advertising than you would see with traditional paid television. Yeah, you keep saying the consumer is the winner here. Let me push back on that, too, because, uh, you know, we think about stuff maybe being behind the paywall. We're going to see that with Peacock in the office. You're going to be able to watch some seasons, not all of them, uh, unless you want to pay. Uh, we saw prices go up, not only Disney, but Netflix. We talked about that before, too. Uh, maybe explain to me maybe at what point the break point comes, right, when some of these streaming services say, look, we can charge 
either we can charge more or we can maybe start to restrict some of the accounts on these uh, shared accounts. When we talk about families maybe splitting Disney Plus, Netflix, at some point it seems like that's the direction we're headed. So how much runway should consumers expect on that front? Right, Zach, it's a great point. But there are different, different ways to look at this. There's one versus pay television where the consumer wins because the consumer used to have to pay for a lot of TV programming that they weren't really interested in. So if you can separate and say, okay, I'm no longer gonna spend 50 to $100 a month on pay television, but I'm gonna to subscribe to a couple of streaming services and spend $20 a month, that's a real savings for the consumer. But if you're also gonna look at it and say, okay, I, I want to have a variety of content, I'm gonna stream an, a, a large number of, of services, these do start to add up. And there are studies out there that say that, you know, most consumers don't wanna spend more than 20 to even $30 a month on streaming. And so the consumer starts to tap out here in terms of the number of streaming services they will subscribe to. And it starts to look very much like that traditional pay TV uh, subscription cost. And when you think about today, the ability to use whether it's Sling um, or Hulu or others to watch what feels more like traditional television, uh, you know, that can get uh, more costly than just you know, 20 to $30 a month. So you're starting to see a variety of options, though, and that's why the consumer wins. It's really the options, the ability to say, I want to spend less than that 50 to 75 to $100 on traditional paid television. I want to spend 20 mm -hmm. to $30 a month. That, that flexibility, and again, no contracts. So if you're going on vacation or you've decided that there's not the right content on that streaming service, you can cut it at yeah. any time and power of streaming. Now, that's a very important point. As a never quarter myself, maybe it's something I don't appreciate uh, as younger people shift over into the streaming space. But Mark Boydman, PJ Solomon, head of marketing, media tech services, appreciate you taking the time to chat. Great. Thanks. Happy New Year to all.